uh, it's kind of feels like this new trend for some folks, um, mm-hmm. right? That sustainability and social equity are, are, are like this new thing that you can, that, that is popular. It's um, language, right? Right. And it's language. And really like so much of the social justice and equity language in relation to sustainability has its roots in the environmental justice movement. And then that has its roots in the civil rights movement. Greetings, everyone. My name is Alfredo Gonzalez Valenzuela, and you are now at the Climate Frontline. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you may be. I appreciate you taking the initiative to tune in to the Climate Frontline podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking to Guillermo Ortiz, specifically around the food basket of the world, the San Joaquin Valley in California, as well as UC Merced. These two are areas where there's a heavy Mexicano population living in. I was particularly interested in centering the voices and experiences of those individuals who are working the farms in the valley. So without further ado, here's our conversation. Yeah, yeah, no. Hey, hey everybody. Um, this, I'm Guillermo Ortiz. I was born and raised uh, in New Jersey, but I uh, come from uh, Puerto Rican roots, both my mother and father. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I guess my, my mentality and, and kind of my, my situation I grew up in was on the East Coast. So that's kind of my, my depth of knowledge there. Um, but live, like you said, living out here in California now, um, getting a sense of, of the differences, right? Both in how we approach the environment and natural spaces from the East Coast and the West Coast, but also um, really getting to know a different kind of different level of culture, right? I'm, I'm used to New Jersey, New York, right? Where you're going to get a lot of Puerto Ricans, a lot of Dominicans, right? And mm-hmm. so uh, even in the Latino culture coming out here out West, obviously you're going to see uh, a lot more Mexican, right? And so yeah. uh, I, th- I think that's been a cultural experience and one that the one that I've enjoyed uh, and kind of just like exploring everything from new music to new food, right? Uh, like it's a, it's, it's yeah, quite yeah. the experience, but um, yeah, I mean, I, in terms of that's where I'm from, where I'm from and where I am right now, but um, kind of in terms of my background related to climate change and, and science and policy that kind of grew up from, uh, my high school experience getting exposed to to courses around the environment around that time and then um, developing that um, when I went to school at Johns Hopkins University for my undergrad. And so um, a lot of my experience in terms of, you know, it's kind of brought me from New Jersey to the mid-Atlantic and then now out <laughs> to California. Um, yeah. And I think uh, the people I met along the way have really shaped, really shaped those experiences and kind of how I view um, in the environment in general, but uh, I feel like I'm always going to be a, a little bit of a Jersey boy, uh, <laughs> no matter where I go. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that, I would say that's a kind of a good intro to who I am. Yeah, I've never really asked you this, but I'm curious. Uh, what, what what was it, or who was it that got you engaged into like you know environmental advocacy, sustainability, and and all this work? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I was, I had, I had an interest, I would say it was, a, I had a, a high school, um, teacher, um, she taught okay. uh, AP, AP environmental science. Um, okay, her, cool. her name, her name uh, was Miss Dower. So shout out to Miss Dower if you ever hear this podcast. Um, but it was a fun class and it was uh, a, a great way to, to learn about what was going on and the environment, different biomes and all that stuff. But it's really the first time I heard the term climate change. Um, mm-hmm. and, it, and I, you know, I actually went into undergrad as a, you know, public health pre-med major. And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be a doctor, uh, you know, with Johns Hopkins. That was like the, the thing that I was going to do. And then 
I was taking biology courses in, uh, that featured some ecology uh, in, at Hopkins. And I was like, well, this environmental stuff is like way more interesting to me. Uh, uh-huh. and <laughs> it seemed like there was just like this existential crisis of climate change where I feel like all the totally. teachers, all the, all the professors were like, we need some talented folks to try and do something here because this is going to be a big problem. And I, uh-huh. and I think, and I think that kind of like call to action is what really yeah. brought me to the work. It's like, it wasn't like, I don't know. I felt like, you know, your biology, your chemistry, your physics, all that was not that they were set in stone as fields, but like climate change and, and, and working. Yeah. And working on ecology was just like, if we don't all like work together on this, we're going to be in some really big issues. And I think that's what called to me is that, that, that kind yeah. of like, that kind of like, we need to bring people together to solve this really complex issue. Right. It's not just going to be the experts. It's not just going to be business people. It's not just going to be politicians like who are going to yeah. be able to solve this on their own. And I think that's what, that's what really um, called out. Yeah, to the me. issue is already here. Right. I'm curious, like, why is why is this important to you like um obviously family is important to you and we can share that but i'm curious to know if there's a particular reason why this work is important to you yeah um i would say one of the reasons is on like just on a on a on a, on a deep like familial level uh, so i grew up in new jersey like i said before and my mom and my dad they were both born and raised in puerto rico and so growing hmm. up my mom always stressed on on trying to you know raise me with 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 the, with the background and heritage that she grew up with right and it was always telling us about the island and we would go on like for christmas and visit relatives and everything but you know for the most part i lived in new jersey right and so puerto rico was always something that like lived in her stories about right and so when i started learning about climate change you know the emphasis was also on not only is this not just a future problem, right, that this is something that's happening now, but that it's impacting, you know, uh, some of the first uh, groups of folks who are going to be impacted are folks who live on islands, right, or small yeah. island developing states. And so part of it was just like, I didn't get a chance to grow up in Puerto Rico, but it was it was such a monumental shaping factor for my mom and my and my dad that like part of it is also like, working on it in, in some hopes that I can protect and save what she cherished most, like growing up in yeah. her childhood, right? That there's mm-hmm. some level of preservation, even, even if I didn't grow up there and, 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 and don't have the same cultural ties. But also I think it's, I think when you find a lot of people who work on climate change, who are really about solving and creating and coming up with creative solutions, I think, there's a sense of community that gets brought into it that that you're working for something greater than yourself, and the, right. and even even in your group of people that you bring together to um, work on it, that there's always this kind of higher purpose of of and, and greater existential threat that you're trying to bring these people together and and work on. And I think uh, I think I, I think especially in in these times, right? I feel like that's necessary, right? People, there, a sense of community is what I think people are lacking uh, in this day and age, whether you're young or old. And I think the beauty of working on climate change work is that you have folks younger, younger than myself, all the way to folks who have, who have such tremendous knowledge, who have been doing this kind of work for decades and longer. Totally. I think you're absolutely right. And for me, the, the question mark that keeps hanging over my head is how is it that we relate to each other? You know, and to what extent is technology allowing us to improve that relationship? And how is it that we relate to our environment? And a big, big part of that to me is is language, right? The language we use and, and how it is that we understand each other. Because one word could mean one thing for one person and it could mean something completely different for the next person. So I'm curious to know, you know, you worked in both coasts now. And you then were in as far as working in Japan, right? <laughs> yeah. Tell me a little bit of like, uh, what what does climate justice mean to you? And and compare and contrast do that to uh, I don't know sustainability or environmental justice. Just curious to know how you understand it. Yeah, um, I think the the topic of language is really interesting in that I've always felt in in, in how I approach climate change and climate change policy. 
I've all I've in some in some regards I've had to untrain myself in that um, I feel like because of the route that I learned about uh, climate change, science and policy was through largely academic settings, right? Mm-hmm. Largely through high school, largely through a university like Hopkins, which is a research institution. And then thus like the method of teaching is very academic and, yeah. and the language they use is very academic. The reports you write are very academic. You're writing everything is, is kind of this evidence-based argument um, with language that is um, meant to be um, both catered to experts and then a general audience. But I think once you kind of enter the real world, right, and then go into spaces where you're trying to make climate action, that mm-hmm. there is people who have different levels of comfort with the language that academia uses. And right. I think, and I think, um, and, and it's, it's not, it's not the term like dumbed down, but how do you make something approachable? Right. And, 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 and more Accessible, importantly, yeah. Yeah, more importantly, how do, how are you, how is someone who's come from an academic background able to learn and better understand folks who have just as much knowledge, but might not have, you know, uh, you know, a degree from Hopkins, right? And that doesn't make their experience any less than 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 my own knowledge or my own experiences. And so, it, it, in a lot of ways, in order to to be active in the work, um, you just have to understand that there's folks with different experiences, and that you are all of equal merit in terms of um, you know what you contribute to society, what you contribute to each other. And that, you know, don't get on your high horse just because you have some fancy paper from some fancy university, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? That, that, that the work that's going to get done affects every human being on this planet. And as a result, you have to be able to communicate with people and understand where they're coming from, no matter what kind of economic background, racial background, cultural background, et cetera, where they are in the country. In the United States, you have to be able to meet people where they're at, I think, to be effective, you have to do that, and I think that's something I've always had been 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 trying to work on, right? Because I know I know what my background is in terms of the academic profile that I learned climate change through, like that lens, um, yeah. isn't really appropriate for every situation. And I think yeah. you have, to, and I and I think you need to have um, some humility there and understand where where that lens is lacking. Yeah. It's an it's an absolute privilege to um, benefit from the work that our parents went through, right? To get mm-hmm. us to an, a situation where we do have access to to this type of education. Yeah. So, absolutely um, thankful for my parents and and all the parents that make that jump to to come to the states to seek a better life. You know. Yeah. Um, so now you are in the San Joaquin Valley. It's known as the food basket of the world. Um, I found out actually that uh, one of the largest oil production uh, fields is there. The third largest actually. And I didn't know that, which is interesting to me. Um, of course, due to so many farm workers living there and you know it being uh, a land that used to belong to mexico uh there's a history with uh, like you were mentioning before there's a history with a, a lot of uh, mexican people right mexican communities and of course mm. cesar chavez uh organized a movement and a movement there in the 1970s so um yeah i'm curious to know how you've been settling with uh uc merced What's interesting about, I think, UC Merced is it's, it's actually a place that I was considering to going to school to simply because I found out that there was so many Latin people that went there, you know? Yeah. And I thought to myself, like, oh, I want to be with the gente. Like, I want to be with people that I, I can relate to, you know? What, what does it mean to you now to be in the middle of all that, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's an interesting space, right, at, at UC Merced. Um and, and one that I think benefits greatly from the diverse culture and and and, and students and both in terms and faculty and staff who who really come here. I think you know like when we're talking about the student body, right? We're talking about uh, and I think I got numbers for 2019. Um, it's about 55% Hispanic or Latino, 
about 19% Asian Pacific Islander, and then around 4.5% African American. And so what you're talking about is a student body that is pretty much 80% people of color. And so I think, uh, and then when we start, I can, and I can look up some numbers for, you know, how many first generation students we have, but it's also, sure. I, I think it's above, I think it's above 60%, but I'll double check that for you. Um, and so these are folks who generally do not come from privileged backgrounds, right. As a, as a, as an overall, um, statement. And so I think, um, UC Merced is also the newest UC school that was established. And so um, it has benefits in terms of sustainability, like directly, right? Because our university is something that has kind of spread, has kind of come out of in the last, um, you know, 20 years, you know, all our buildings, right, are, are, are built to lead standards, um, you know, and, and can reach gold to platinum, right, that we're using renewable energy on campus, that we're um, increasing our level of electric vehicle use on campus. So, you know, we, we're allowed to start, you know, a little bit ahead of everyone in terms of, because all the infrastructure that we have is, is, is new. Is, has been recently yeah. built and you know you're not operating with campuses that have been out there for decades and decades and decades and and, and some of the changes they have to make and so for that i think it allows us to be forward thinking and try to be a leader uh, across the university of california system around issues of sustainability and then within my role at the university i'm the sustainability and diversity educational programs manager and one of the things i wanted to kind of bring to that table uh, in terms of leadership at you at the at the UC level across the system, is also this focus on on social justice and equity within our sustainability work. Um, because I think, as you mentioned before, uh, it, it kind of feels like this new trend for some folks, um, mm -hmm. right? That sustainability and social equity are, are are like this new thing that you can that that is popular. It's um, language, right? Right, and it's language, and really. Like so much of the social justice and equity language in relation to sustainability has its roots in the environmental justice movement. And then that has its roots in the civil rights movement. Right. And mm -hmm. so I think, I think the connection, I think people are, uh, some people around the country are, are, are thinking that these are new ideas in many ways. These are just unfulfilled promises from previous mm -hmm. social justice movements, right. That, they were able to advance the, the the ball and provide so much more progress for us. And then the things that were left over that they weren't able to accomplish, um, you know, because there are still folks who are fighting for social justice, those issues yeah. are coming up and again. And we're just using either new language or sometimes it's even the same language just repurposed. Um, yeah. You know, but, you know, I think there's a, we have a, a space here at UC Merced given the important role that we serve in the Central Valley to our students um, to advance not only a sustainability message, but also understanding how that's been tied to social justice movements. And, you know, I, I, I recently started, uh, so I think there's a lot of, of ideas that I would like to work on, but haven't had the opportunity, especially during COVID. Um, right. but, I'm, but I'm hoping that we get, we, we start advancing in that direction. And I think as I get more accustomed to the role and, and meet more folks in the community, I think I'll be able yeah. to do, do to do more of that. Totally. Um, I'm curious to know, because I, I like what you said, you know, that the language is really catered to the audience you're speaking to. And how do you plan on, on catering some of this language with the youth that will be coming into the UC uh, system at, at UC Merced? Yeah, well, you know, one of the issues that I think pops up at a micro level at, uh, you know, at, in higher education in the in the sustainability world that I think reflects pretty much into like the macro level of like geopolitics and international relations, right? It's always the issue of resources, who has mm -hmm. and who and who doesn't. Yeah. Um, and like you mentioned, we're um, University of California, right? And so even amongst um, state schools around the country. We are seen as being one of the systems that has the most resources, has some of the most, um, you know, talented professors, 
and, and experts. And, and the reality is, you know, as much as I think I, I would love for every um, university to kind of have the resources that, the, that our system does, right? But like there's other states where they don't have state schools who are able to, to kind, of, um, kind of match up in terms of caliber. And I think that's what we really have to think about is um, in this in this progress towards climate solutions, you know, it's it's not good enough if only the people with resources are the ones who are able to invest in resiliency or invest in renewable energy or electric vehicles, because climate change is going to affect everyone. You know, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you live on the coast or you don't. You know, it's going to impact you. And I think that because of that, we need to have and develop more collaborative spaces, especially um, if, if for those of us who have the privilege to have more resources in comparison to others, especially um, I'm thinking of in comparison to those folks in the United States. But obviously, when you're thinking of, you know, the United States versus the international community or, or, or developing nations, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of history there, a lot of um, a mix of colonialism, imperialism, racism, et cetera, that have shaped the dynamics of resources on a global scale. Um, yeah. So I, I don't, I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want to brush that over uh, and focus only on the U.S. side. But you know, there are discrepancies and um, and levels of inequality that exist in this within this country. Um, that we really need to address if we're going to um, address climate change. I think we're, you're seeing it in, you know, the results of that with COVID, right? And how it's impacting people of color and low-income folks disproportionately, right? People who might not have the health care that they um, should have, right, in a country like the United States. And so there becomes, and you'll see that manifest itself also, as we see more and more climate impacts, right? It's, you know, I think the the overlap there is pretty significant and uh, we have to be able to really communicate with one another, collaborate with one another, um, because I think you'll just get kind of these in, um, these systems that will just produce inequality in our responses to climate change as well. Um, and my hope is kind of, not only collaborating more across the UC system, uh, but also with other universities, both domestically and internationally, to kind of help um, develop thinking and in, in, around collaboration around climate change. And I think there, part of that will also have, require an understanding of where where we are as a country, and thus what is our responsibility to climate climate action. Um, yeah. But, you know, but given that we overall, in terms of historical um, cumulative emissions, we are the number one emitter uh, in in history when it comes to things like CO2. I think we have a, a big responsibility to play on a global scale to um, make sure that everyone is able to respond to the changes as a result of climate change. Yeah, it's interesting to me as I was thinking about um climate frontline communities and how you may be related to to it or the work you're doing right now, at least. Uh, you know, given that San Joaquin Valley is a food basket of the world, it's interesting that although it has all this agricultural productivity, that there's still a lot of food insecurity areas nearby. You know, it's like you have so much food, but yet people are still lacking food in that area. So I would almost, you know, go as far as characterizing the individuals that are working in the farms as those who are at the front line, you know. Um, yeah, no, 100%. The, the, the folks who are out there picking up strawberries, grapes, they're going through it with COVID, with the fires going on right now. Yeah, and the heat uh, wave. And the, and heat, the heat wave. wave. And yeah. it's like, they're still out there and they're still doing it and – um and and that to me, I think says you know like I, I I agree with you in the sense that like hey you know let's collaborate with other universities ac across the the globe and and you know I'm all for collaboration. I also think you know 
in a more smaller scale, there's actions to be had more locally around the people who are just right on your backyard, you know, who mm. maybe simply just like, they may not understand climate change. They may not understand carbon emissions and how those are related to how it's impacting uh, the change that we're seeing in our environment, but they're certainly feeling it. And they're certainly, you know, experiencing it every day, whether it's a sunburn on their back or, uh, you know, just the pesticides that they're exposed to when they're picking up the food. So yeah. Uh, any thoughts around? <laughs> yeah, no. And, 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 and that's, I think that's a very good point, right? I think even there, I, I think I reveal my own um, academic preference, right? Like it's always that kind of like, oh, we'll collaborate with other researchers and, and other universities. And, 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 you know, when there's a history of folks with a tremendous amount of knowledge about our environment, right? Like, like you said, literally, you know, on our back door. In terms of what I've, what we've been working on related to that, um, UC Merced has a rural justice summit uh, that occurs on an annual basis, uh, um, where we gather folks, um, really who are impacted in all respects to our agricultural systems, right? And and the whole summit is centered around um, this concept of rural justice and what does that mean hmm. uh, for the folks who are involved. Unfortunately, right, it got delayed because we can't have a big gathering of people during COVID. Um, yeah. we're, ho- we're hoping that, um, you know, that that process is continued in the upcoming year, right? That, you know, once we hopefully get a, a hold over COVID and, and, and its response and, you know. Yeah, that sounds we'll, really cool. I'd love to find out know. more about it. Yeah, and in that in that in that kind of summit, it's you know there's art there's an art gallery, there's workshops with folks, there's panel mm-hmm. discussions, there's you know conversations with the community, um, and it's kind of like this community event, right, to talk about um, you know what is or is not working in our agricultural system, uh, yeah. and, and across all you know all the folks who are um, involved in that. And I think, and I think you're absolutely right in in defining, um, you know, those workers as frontline communities, right? Uh, and in in a world where, um, you know, many of their immigration status might be, um, make you know, them vulnerable, make 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 them vulnerable. They right. simultaneously get labeled essential, right? Yeah. So you're in in a, in a world where you, some of them might feel or, or, you know, are feeling that they're unwanted in this country. Yeah. They're then told, actually, not only are you not, not only are you unwanted, right? They're hearing that message from the American people, but they're also hearing, but you're also essential, which I think is such a, like a dichotomy, the, right? Yeah. <laughs> Double-edged sword. It's like, it's we a, don't a, want a, you to go, but you should go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not only not, not only that we don't want you to go, it, it's essentially like, we can't have you go. You are an essential yeah. component of mm-hmm. what makes our lives work at the end of the day. And so I and think, yeah. If I ahead. may add to, to this complexity that you're describing is that, you know, I'm excited about this summit you're describing to me uh, when when I think of you know initiatives around food, people who are doing great work, right? Mm-hmm. They often lean on metrics that can be numbers, and with numbers you can twist numbers, and yeah. with different metrics you can do whatever. To me, a summit, and you know, you and I met at a conference. Yeah. A summit, we're able to get people face to face to talk about real issues in a in a constructive way, right? Yeah, And to me, it would be transformational if you can get some of those people who are at the front line to talk about those, those with those individuals who are starting initiatives around how we think about food and what is, quote unquote, sustainable food, you know, because right. that to me can create a lot of conversations, one, and then like innovative approaches to tackling this this problem. Right. And, and for example, like in, in this conversation around climate justice, like I would posit, right, that food that is produced by workers who are underpaid, who are exposed to pesticides, who are exposed to uh, other environmental harms like like the wildfires and the smoke that they're producing, inherently can't be determined or labeled as sustainable. 
right? Because yeah. sustainability, um, as we traditionally think about it, is about it's about social, economic, and environmental sustainability. And that social component is one that's harder to measure and harder to quantify, which often means that people ignore it. But it's it's critical there. So you know, when we're t- thinking about here in California, these wildfires and the smoke, uh, we also have to know that there's a history of um, environmental harms that have been inflicted upon um, these workers historically. Um, you know, and that was some of the things that, uh, for example, Cesar Chavez um, and his and his movement um, and many of the folks who worked on those on that civil rights um, work were fighting against, right? And that. We haven't, we haven't, those issues didn't go away and they're, and now we're having new ones. And I think that's yeah. the dangers of climate change when we're thinking about um, social equity is that like, we haven't solved the, the issue of social justice yet, like in terms of making sure everyone has um, uh, these equal rights and these um, abilities to express themselves. Um, and now, now we're adding brand new variables, right? ones that we don't even know completely how they're going to shape our society and so if we don't make a meaningful choice to address social equity now then in a world that's constantly going to be changing because of climate change and its impacts it's going to be much more difficult like at the end of the day Hmm. yeah you can definitely hear the passion you have for uh I think just from your time in, in DC, right, engaging in, in the political processes and, and wanting more people to be engaged. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's, there's just so many experiences you've had that I, I want to take some time to explore, but I'm curious to know, you know, um, you're in Merced now, mm-hmm. like we had spoken about earlier. When classes get going, you know, you're going to have more youth you're going to engage with and hopefully uh, we have an adequate way to adapting to the new COVID world. Mm-hmm. What, what are what are your words that you're going to share when youth come up to you and, you know, their dad is picking strawberries in, in the Valley and they are being encouraged to become an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. And here they meet you, you know, here you are Guillermo and, um, what do you what do you say to them to get them engaged? Because what I'm hearing from you too, and in, in, in other instances, you've been at tables where there's heads of environmental organizations who are there, and the values they bring to the table personally, um, they may have some shortcomings too. So it almost seems like there's an opportunity for these youth to be part of these organizations and bring justice to to the communities that they have relationship with to their parents to their dads their moms to their families mm-hmm. so it, when the school opens back up the you see said uh what what are the words you would share to them um to get them to think about this these issues yeah you know what i would say is right i think it, when it comes to climate change, I, I think of it as a, it's an all hands on deck situation, whether, you know, no matter what you do for career, you have a role to play in, 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 in climate solutions. Right. And, you know, I don't want, what, what I don't want people to think is, oh, I'm a doctor. Climate change isn't my space. Right. Or I'm a lawyer. Climate change is in my space. Right. Um, and I think, part of the reason people see that that way is like this like narrative that's been crafted around what the problem of climate change is right um which is right we're just putting too much co2 in the air right Mm -hmm. that's the problem that's the problem right it's not you know which is a different framing than saying like well maybe the economic systems that we've put in place create an exploitative structure that not only harms human beings, but also our planet, right? That's a completely different argument mm-hmm. that I think, um, you know, that could be examined, but it's, it's also, it's, it's also saying when it comes to climate change, right? That there, if you're an engineer, right. And, and there's different, there's a lot of different kinds of engineer, whether you're a civil engineer and building, 
you know, infrastructure, right? Are you, are you looking to do that in the most sustainable way possible, right? You have a role to play, I think, in that regard. When we're thinking about doctors and we're thinking about what our healthcare system can do um, in a world where we're going to have more tropical diseases, right, coming up because of their expanded nature, because of warming temperatures, in a world where we're going to have heat waves that threaten the elderly, or we're going to have, uh, we're seeing it in California, right? There's been this like layer of smoke outside that's bad for people who have um, respiratory issues and, 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 and you know, uh, babies and, and, and the elderly, et cetera, right? Um, doctors will be treating these people. They will be, um, and, and, and for those folks who are public health oriented, they're going to be looking to create, you know, preventative measures that kind of, you know, address the problem before it even starts. Like those people have a stake in the game when it comes to climate change, in my opinion. Um, so it's all hands on deck, regardless of what career you decide picking, your abuelita is going to, be at risk with the heat wave so get engaged yeah get engaged i mean and and look like you don't you know environmental work happens outside of environmental organizations right they mm -hmm. might just not call it that right don't think that if you're not part of one of the big green groups or one of the maybe even if you're talking about environmental justice organizations one of the bigger environmental justice organizations that like you then don't have a role to play when it comes to climate change i was like I promise you, if you're working on immigration issues, you're going to deal with climate change sooner or later, because the reality is there are a lot of people around the world located on coastlines, located by waterways, located near natural resources, areas that are going to be hit by drought, areas that are going to be hit by um, mudslides, right? Like all of these environmental effects. There are, there's going to be mass migrations of people as our planet deals it's already with, happening, right? and it's already happening. And, and, and so, you know, you know, I remember when folks were talking about in this country, when, you know, they were talking about the, the caravan of people, right. That was coming, uh, from, coming Guatemala. To, from Guatemala, the Southern border. It's like yeah. for people who are, who are, who are following why some people are leaving some of these countries, it's like some of them cannot produce food on their land anymore. And so are looking to go elsewhere. These people are 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 people who are what I would call climate refugees, people whose land are becoming uninhabitable because of what we've done to our planet. And we're that's going to happen everywhere. There's going to be movements of people all over, even in within this country, right? There's going to be like whether depending on how heat waves and everything plays out. People might want to go further northeast, right, or further further north, depending on you know how these climate impacts access to hit water and access to water. And like, yeah. you know, if you like, so let's I say, if you're working on immigration, if you're working on healthcare, you're working on on e on on, on econ uh, economic policy, et cetera, et cetera. You have to be thinking about climate change. It, it just affects. It is. It just affects everything, and and yeah. so I would tell these people one that, uh, you know, if not you, who else, right? When it comes to climate change and 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 and, and trying to make some significant progress, um, this isn't something we can put off for like 10, 20, 30 years, right? And like we'll figure it out. This is going to be something that people every day have to be working towards. Um, and that means changing systems that are producing the problems that exist in our in on a global scale when it comes to our environment. But it, it, it and because of that, you're going to need people like the generations who are who are going through school, not going this through school. Um, you know, these people have have a role to play, and that that you know, if they are not the ones getting involved, at the end of the day, they're going to inherit whatever it is whatever yeah. world that we give them that that is what they will get and they're going to wonder why they got such a such a messed up deal and i i know people like That's you and me ahead of the problem i know people like you and me are going to say like we did our best to give you something workable yeah but at the same time like i like and we're seeing it with so many younger you know sometimes i feel like 
man, I really need to do a lot more because some of these young people younger than me, uh, you know, there's folks in elementary school who are, who are out on the streets protesting, right? Who are out on the streets demanding climate action. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you know I remember myself in elementary school, I was probably interested in, you know, what like some kind of cartoon or something like that, right? And not just like the existential crisis of climate change. So I think, I just think that like young people have, have, have shown that they're willing to step up, but you know, they can't do it by themselves. They need yeah. our help. They need I'm our curious help to know, uh, Guillermo, from, from the time, you know, you were engaged in this high school class until now, there's different spaces that you navigate, you know? Yeah. Can you share a little bit about what your role has been in those spaces and, and how it's changed? Yeah. As it relates um, to the work. Yeah. Um, yeah. You do put on so many different hats, like as you walk through this world, right? Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a Johns Hopkins alumni. I'm an alumni of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Um, you know, I have friends who I've, who still work on the Hill and I worked on the Hill. I've worked in um, policy organizations. Um I, I, For the I, youth that I, don't know, the hill is Washington D.C. Yes, yeah. See, see, with these acronyms and these things, uh, language, the language, right? The language, yeah, language is so important, uh, and often language is the way that we keep people out. So. Um, thank you for clarifying on that point. Um, but also, you know, I walk in as a, as a man, as a person of color, um, uh, as, as a Puerto Rican and all of those different hats are constantly being, being put on and put off in different situations. Um, and I think how I've kind of tried to keep consistency in, in terms of always being true to who I am is, always uh trying to carry through honestly a lot of the lessons that my mother has taught me over uh over the years right to be to be genuine to be heartfelt to um if you're going to try and build a collaborative solution that like you like gotta be meeting people where they're at because um you can have the best idea ever but if you can't bring people along with you like it won't go anywhere you won't and you, like, you know, leadership means it's not just like telling people what to do. It's um, mobilizing folks to achieve things that they never thought that they could achieve by themselves. Yeah. And to do that, you have to be uh, you have to be willing to to listen and learn. And for me, I think that's what I've always tried to do in my personal relationships. Um, and the person I've tried to be is, um, you know, just and it's, be, it's so hard given like all our, our all of our time constraints and all the things that we're working on. But really, cultivating meaningful, genuine relationships with folks um, is part of how I keep that consistency of putting those hats on and off. Right? It's just that yeah. there's that core right there that you always return to, um, yeah. and and that, I think that's for me. That's what um, you know, staying true to yourself is what really is going to give you a path that you can walk on, especially when things get rocky. Um, you know, when, when, when you don't know which way is up and you don't know which way the world is going to throw you. And often the world picks like some of the best times and some of the worst times to just like completely change your life. And I think um, having something that you can always hold on to about who you are and what you're trying to achieve, I think helps you navigate those spaces. Um, I think that's been in terms of answering your question about like, how do you keep kind of that, how has that changed over time? Um, I think uh, definitely when I, I think I would definitely say when I was younger, I was um, definitely more arrogant about my knowledge of the world. Um, and I feel like I was more of this, of, of the, um, I've, I've learned all of these things. And if only we did the one thing that I think we should do, everything would be okay. And mm -hmm. I think, and I, and I think that's, a, that's a, a level of arrogance that comes with youth. <laughs> um, that's, uh, 
has changed over time. And I think the more I've learned, it's like the more I've learned, it, I realize there's so much I don't know and that's okay. And that there are so many people who are willing to share that knowledge with me as long as I come to that conversation with respect and humility. Um, and there won't be a space where I will know everything all the time and that's okay. Uh, but that's why I have to work with other people because together we can cover so much that we couldn't do before. And yeah. Um, yeah and, 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 you know, just make sure that I'm treating people the way I want to be treated is, is, is something that my mom has always been really pushing uh, ever since I was little. And I would say like my greatest successes in any kind of office space, personal relationships, um, or otherwise is like, is that mentality. I think people, when people coming from a heartfelt place, I think people can tell the difference. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I, that resonates with me a lot. And, um, family goes a long way at the end of the day, right? It really yeah, man. brings values to the table. Um, I think I'll, I'll wait uh, for the folks listening in if you want to hear my conversation with Guillermo about energy because I know there's a lot of interest in energy and mm -hmm. you have some experience with energy. I'm going to invite them to go to the Patreon page where they can listen to that conversation uh, that I'll have with Guillermo. Otherwise, um, yeah, I'd be curious to know, you know, tell me who you are. You already touched on this a little bit, but tell me who you are as a person and how you like to spend your time Uh in a non-COVID world as well as a COVID world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in a, in a, in a non-COVID world, um, who am I? Who, right? Who am I in, in a non-COVID world right now? Um, look, I'm someone who thrives, right? Being with people. Uh, I think I like that. That is what... This, that's what I've strived for in my personal life. That's what I've strived for in my professional life. So I think COVID in particular um, is difficult in that it's harder to to get to those people, right? My, my good friends and family. Um, however, we found we found our ways. Like I, I feel like so many people have. Um, and if you haven't, I hope that this all ends very very soon so that you can uh, return to the people that you care about and and love. Um, And I think, uh, you know, I do f tend to f love, like, I love going on camping trips with friends. I love going out and being in nature. I think it's calming. I mm -hmm. think it, it, for me, it gives me, um, so, so much of like growing up on the East Coast, it was like, I grew up in a suburban uh, yeah. community, but I was like Northern Jersey. So it's like, like, you know, half an hour away from New York. So like you can get to very urban areas very quickly. And so like natural spaces feel like returning home, if that makes sense. Like yeah. it, 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 it's like for your spirit, like kind of like this is where we should be kind of mentality. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's camping, but also like, uh, you know, I'm a sucker for video games as well. So I, okay, I, I, cool. I'm, a, I'm a little bit of both. Like I'm one person who likes to be outdoors and then I'm also a person who <laughs> will also enjoy being indoors. Yeah, um, yeah. And so COVID has been a mixed experience on that regard. It's allowed uh, me to be at I'm work. Curious. I have some guesses, but what's your favorite type of food? Oh man. Uh, I gotta say like, it's, it's such a cheating answer, but like anything uh, that my mom makes, Um, because like, uh, she is such an eclectic person when it comes to like, <laughs> what she likes to cook. So like, it'll be, you know, and I've been fortunate, like she came out to visit for my birthday, which was in April, which was like after COVID, but she came early, early March. Right. Um, she, cause she was like, Oh, I'll spend a month with you and then I'll go back to Virginia. Right. And then COVID happened. So she's been, yeah, yeah. she's been with me, um, basically all during all during covid so up until uh, was that, all, that's in august good, now yeah. right and it's been yeah. a great thing because like i said before family is so um you get your favorite critical. Food. right and it and like it's, a, it's such a, a such a guilty pleasure of having your mom there and so like i've been yeah. trying to get, get her to teach me how to make some of the things that i used to love growing up um, yeah so i can like 
learn and 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 be able to do those things. That, that um, was gonna be it, like it never it never turns out as good as she does it, but uh, you know, <laughs> I think I think that just comes with experience. Um, yeah. uh, but like, uh, like, I mean, I, I'm I I always love her Puerto Rican food, uh, but she cooks some mean Italian dishes as well. So I'm like, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. But it, it yeah. really reminds you of just, and my grandmother's here too as well. So, um, you know, that's always like having both of them here and, and, and while well, my, um, you know, it energizes you, doesn't it? It does. It does. In a time where there's so much uncertainty, um, I feel like being with family, um, is so rejuvenating. Um, yeah. and, and it, it really does stop the, those kind of, that, that feeling of isolation that I feel like it's creeping in on a lot of people's lives as people all think about like what's important to them. Like I really do feel having family and friends like yourself that I can have a conversation or maybe hop on a podcast with yeah. is, is, is like so rejuvenating, so rejuvenating for the soul. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear, but that was my dog. Um, howling yeah. in the background yeah i gotta i gotta uh, our dog is downstairs too and that's another yeah. thing the dog is like like probably putting in a lot of work keeping all our happiness at like good levels right i feel like yeah, yeah. i feel like dogs are like one of the best things to ever happen to human beings <laughs> yeah i was gonna guess that you were gonna say something like you know my mom's cooking but i i think i was right on uh, <laughs> what's it called yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. You know, I was also gonna ask. You know, where you get your hope from? You know, to like keep moving forward mm -hmm. with this work. But um, part of me says that it's family too, right? Like family, and you already kind of said this, but like you know, treasuring what they care about and making sure you're uh, being engaged with them, right? Yeah, it's it's family, and and <laughs> and amongst my friends and family, like I am known as like a a hopeless optimist, uh, mm. you know, especially, and then especially amongst the folks I work with when it comes to climate change, because like, there's always that feeling, right. Uh, for folks who work on climate change that you're dealing with the end of the world kind of mentality. Yeah. And so it's like, there's uh, people often ask, like, you know, it can often seem so overwhelming. Like, how do you do it? And uh, I think a big, big part of it is like, when you when you're doing the work and you're really interacting with people like mm -hmm. there's just so like human beings are, are just such fascinating creatures like we have so much potential for just absolutely wonderful things yeah in the same capacity we can also be capable of like some of the worst things that we yeah. can possibly do but it's the people who who constantly try and push for bigger and better things, not only for themselves, but for the people around them, the planet around them, other living things that gives me hope, right? Is that, is that there's these, like, no matter how hard, bleak things get, that there are these people out there who just look at you and just say, like, walk with me and we can build something better. Yeah. And like, when I, when I see that, it makes me want to be one of those people. And it just makes me want to, like, to say, yeah, I'm, I want to walk on this road with you. Let's do it. Right? Let's do it. Like, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how convoluted that path may look, like, if, 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 if we can bring other people with us who want to bring some good into this world, like, the only thing that will ever stop us is if we stop walking. And, yeah. you, and like, with those kind of people, you never want to, right? You always want yeah. to keep pushing. Thanks for taking the time to be at the show uh, here at the Climate Frontline podcast. Anything else you like to share or uh, yeah, shout um, out wisdom you like to? Yeah, yeah. Share? I think I think one thing. I'll obviously, shout out to all all the friends and family out there who I haven't been able to to see in person because of COVID. But uh, I'm looking forward to the times that we could reunite. Um, and I think for all the people who are just overwhelmed with. Um, the scale and the scope of the issues that we as a society, and I mean that on a global scale, are dealing with. Um, just remember that there are other people there to support you, to walk with you, even though it's difficult to find them sometimes. That um, don't give in, don't lose hope, and 
walk with us and, and make sure that we can, can build a world that we all are looking for, that honors everyone's individualism and also the collective. And I think I want, um, you know, after COVID is done and all of that, I hope we take some real, really important lessons from it about what it means to be a part of a community, what it means to um, build something for one another. And I think, I hope we become a more um, loving society as a result of the trauma that I think collectively we're all experiencing. Um, and more, more imp most importantly, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to have this uh, great conversation with you during COVID, right? And, and, and uh, you know, I feel like it's one Zoom meeting after another Zoom meeting uh, on a given day, but it's good to have a conversation with a friend. Yeah, this is slightly different, right? I mean... <laughs> no, 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 this is, no this, is, this is a great conversation with a very good friend. And so I, I, I cherish that opportunity. Guillermo Ortiz, you know, such a pleasure to uh, have you in the podcast. Um, what is the best way for any youth to get in touch with you or what's the best way to engage with you if, you know, they hear that, hey, this gentleman Guillermo has experience here and there and I want to do that. What's what's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, I think the best way to, to reach out to me is uh, either via LinkedIn uh, I actually get a couple of, a fair amount of responses from people reaching out there. And I always, I always do my best to respond, but also uh, my personal email, uh, more than happy to give that out to you guys. It's guillermo.ortiz.92 at gmail.com. Uh, just feel free to shoot me uh, an email. And, you know, if it's something that you want to schedule a call or you want to talk a little bit more, um, yeah, we'll set something up. Guillermo Ortiz, thank you very much. Thank you. That was the first part of my conversation with Guillermo. The second part is more focused on Puerto Rico for a future episode. So stay tuned for that. What was it that you enjoyed most about this conversation? What was it that stood out to you? And what are your takeaways that you may want to share with someone else? I'm curious to know. As well as if you have any recommendations of other individuals, leaders who are engaging in this type of work across the United States or its territories. I'd be curious to know what your suggestions are. Please visit the climatefrontline.com website where you can find out more about this podcast and myself. I will see you next time at the Climate Frontline. Thanks. The communities who are experiencing the worst effects of climate change are those who are best positioned to innovate solutions. Thank you for tuning in and being part of the Changing the Narrative. See you next time at the Climate Frontline. <laughs>